Our speaker this is uh, from IAS. He's the director of LNG White State and also the associate dean of theological seminary in IAS. This evening, as we ask Dr. Joel and Salmuter to speak to us, we continue to ask the Lord to speak that His name be glorified. So uh, may the Lord bless us as we listen to the voice of God. Good evening. Happy Sabbath to everybody. We're happy that we can come today to the Lord in praise and gratitude and to be able to listen to Him as we worship Him this evening. You will be embarking on a conference on the gift of prophecy and we shall begin with a very famous uh, text in the Bible on this subject. Let us uh, open our Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 20 verse 20. Maybe we can use this as our as scripture reading this evening. I suppose this will be a uh, this will be a theme uh, the, the theme of your conference 20 verse 20. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we would like to listen to you. We'd like to welcome you into our midst today. Kindly speak to our hearts. Touch us, Lord. And may it be that as a result of our encounter with you today, our lives will be changed. We will be renewed. We will go out from this hall of worship filled with the assurance that you'll be with us, that you have forgiven our sins. And we have met you today. Thank you so much for hearing answer our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. We will be going through times of crisis, times when you will be making decisions. And this can define our, our future, our even destiny, some of the decisions that we will be making on this. And and what will be your standard? What will be your North Star when you make decisions? When you are even that will influence your actions? So crisis can bring this about. We can have personal crisis. We can also have a corporate crisis. But crisis are, is not in a way negative, isn't it? It is in fact, in many ways, it can bring out the best of us, out of us. We have Chinese students there in IAS, and I ask them, you know, I think the Chinese language is very picturesque or graphic. The, na the their voc vocabulary represents uh, pictures, isn't it? So it's almost like the hieroglyphics. You know, you have pictures telling you what, is, uh, what would this, uh, the, the meaning of this word. So I asked them, what would be the Chinese characters for crisis? And they said, uh, I think it's in Mandarin, they said it's wazy. Wazy, meaning crisis is danger. But at the same time, it is an opportunity. So in a crisis, there is danger, but it is also an opportunity. And that is why Chinese are good in business, because they will look at something that is negative, but they can look at things that are positive. I remembered 
I remembered one time, uh, I think this, uh, who is this owner of the Jalebi? You know, he's a Chinese person from Davao. He was interviewed in Ateneo de Manila University Business School. And that time, the economy of the Philippines was quite low. It was bad economy that time. And so he was interviewed and said, uh, what can you say about the economic situation of the Philippines? And many said, oh, it is bad. And he said, it's good, very good. And they said, how can you say that? He said, yeah, for one thing, the foreigners will not come here, so we don't have competition. They will not invest here, so we have the Philippines at least uh, to our own. Because the So you see, he looked at something that was quite negative, but he saw something positive out of this. And this evening, I'd like to give a title to our discussion. I, I was really thinking that this is a, more of a devotional, devotional meeting, but it seems to me that it is more of a lecture. Is it? Yeah. We have not primed ourselves so much into worship, in fact. You know, I think uh, we didn't have even like uh, uh, hymns and on. So, but I'd like to title this, How to Turn Crisis into Opportunities. How to turn catastrophes into victories. Because this is what you will be able to see. And you will see that the guidance of the Lord is very important as we will make, as we will face crisis. So let me invite you to open your Bibles to Second Chronicles, the whole chapter of Second Chronicles. What we have read just recent, uh, just, uh, you know, recently, a few minutes ago is... It's the verse that we often uh, quote in our classes. But let us look at the whole context. Let us look at the story. And I'd like you to give you an, an, an assignment. You see, this is a story of king, of a king, a successful king, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was one of the best kings in, uh, in the story of the kings in, of Judah. And in this case, he was very successful, and he gave us the key. But I would like you to look at, look at the story and enumerate some of the keys on why Jehoshaphat was successful in this, in this case. So let us uh, read our Bible. Okay. Still working. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Meunites came to make war in, on Jehoshaphat. War is always a crisis, isn't it? War is always a crisis. I don't know what happened. Of course, it's not only war that can bring crisis. There's a lot. The tsunami and the earthquake. But even just a few uh, disgruntled soldiers occupying awkward uh, uh, towers in Makati will bring the nation to a crisis. So this was a crisis. There was a crisis because the Moabites, the Meunites, the Ammonites came to make war of Jehoshaphat. Let us, uh, let us pause for a moment. Who are these Moabites? Who are these Meunites? Neighboring countries, okay. You know, how many of you have been to Jerusalem? Hmm, Israel at yeah, of course. Yeah, you can Google. Yeah, please go to Google today. Uh, you, so now uh, say it's almost like this, really. You know, we are on a hillside, and if we can imagine that that uh, valley there or this Laguna Lake is a valley, it's a, it's the Jordan River there. You know, there are two bodies of water in Israel, isn't it? There's the uh, Sea of Galilee, and then there's the Red Sea, or the Red Sea. Sorry, not the Red Sea, Red Sea. Sorry. And so this is connected by the river Jordan. So if you are standing, you say, let's, uh, let's face north, okay? Uh, so on your right would be somewhere, it would be Syria, Damascus, isn't it? And then down here would be Jordan. Uh, so if you are facing north, then this will be uh, Mediterranean. And uh, down there would be uh, Egypt, okay? So when we, you face east, now the, you will be facing 
Syria and Jordan, then you have mountains. These are, I think they call it the Golan Heights, is yeah? And these are where there's a beyond the river. So these are uh, this is the place of the Meunites, the Ammonites, the Moabites. These are these people are really their relatives, isn't it? Have you remembered Lot and Abraham? You know, they divided and the Moabites. So the descendants of Lot. So they are they are, are from this. They banded themselves together at this time. And then they made war against Jehoshaphat. So Jerusalem is about 700 feet above sea level. So you, go down, you have to go down to Jordan and then you have to come. I think many of your theology teachers will be there in 2012, isn't it? June 2012, I think. The theology teachers will be there. There is a conference in Jerusalem. So some men, verse 2, some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom. On this side from the other side of the sea which is the other side of the river it is already in Hazas on Tamar so Jehoshaphat being a king he had this uh, intelligence network and said ah they are coming they didn't have cell phones then you see, no? or satellite uh, images now it's really very huh? high tech you see Last Friday, I was, uh, we were, uh, we were water, watering our lawn. Somebody came and said, mm, have you received the news? Of course. We saw the news already 30 minutes ago. That was the tsunami. You know, you can, you can even see really the tsunami coming as, as, as it happens huh? in Japan. Of course, this time they didn't have this yet. So they have this network. Verse 3, what happened to Jehoshaphat? This was a crisis. In fact, a national crisis. Neighbors, uh, neighboring countries have bonded themselves together. Now they are coming to make war against Jehoshaphat. They were now coming, surrounding the city of Jerusalem. Alarm, verse 3. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. So what did he do? The first thing that he did in a time of crisis. Okay, what is that there in your Bible? Uh, uh, do you have King James Version? I like the King James Version because the King James Version says, Resolve to seek the Lord. Or actually he said, if he was afraid. And because of that the fear, he resolved to seek the Lord. So, you see, I have given you an assignment this evening. I would like you to discover what are some of the secrets of Jehoshaphat's success. And secret number one seems to be, he resolved to seek the Lord. It's not so much really of the actions, it seems, by Jehoshaphat. Because if you look at Jehoshaphat, this is Jehoshaphat's uh, attitude. He always will ask the Lord for guidance in making decisions. Let me point out to you verse uh, 3 of 19. Huh? This is about Jehoshaphat. Let us, uh, Second Chronicles 19, when Jehoshaphat king of Judah returned safely to his palace in Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat the, the son of Hanani went out to meet him and said to the king, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? You remember the Ahab, you know, Jehoshaphat was trying to, uh, because Ahab was his compare, you know, and Ahab was, uh, was a rebel, and he visited Ahab. Ahab is the king of Judah, of, of, of uh, the northern kingdom, you say, in Samaria. Yeah. Uh, Samaria, this is based in Samaria. And uh, their children got married. And so he went there, and so... Uh, Ahab had a big trouble there. So when he came back to Jerusalem, uh, the prophet came to him and said, uh, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. There is, however, some good in you. For you have read the land of Asherah poles and have set your heart on seeking God. Okay, this is the description of who Jehoshaphat is. He is always 
seeking God. The first thing that he did here in a, in a crisis is what? Resolve to seek the Lord. This is secret number one. God first policy. Everything we do, it should be God. You know, uh, what does, what saith the Lord? If you compare David and Saul, you just compare David and Saul. Why David was more successful than Saul? Physically, Saul probably is much, much better. Huh? He is, you know, he is outstanding. But it was something on attitude. It's not the altitude according to uh, John Maxwell. Huh? John Maxwell said, it's not, uh, it's not the altitude, but the attitude. The attitude. David will always say, do we have a prophet here? Do we have any word from the Lord? But Saul will always just go on his own way, thinking, uh, making decisions for himself. He, you, you can, and so Jehoshaphat seems to be following this attitude of David. He will always seek the Lord first. The first thing he did was to seek the Lord. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I would propose that if the direction is always, your direction is always for the Lord, you can't go wrong. If it is always God first, the first consideration of making decisions of whatever will you do, then you can't go wrong. It is when we have other directions. You see, I remembered one professor in Ayas. I said, it doesn't really matter if you are near God or away from God. As long as your direction is toward God. So if you compare this person, he is nearer here. See, maybe he has a, he has, he is an ordained minister, but his direction is away from God, then that person is very dangerous. But here's a drug addict, he's far away from God, but his direction is always going to God, then that would be an advantage. You know, seeking the Lord all the time. The first thing he did, so seek ye first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So, I would encourage you. This is a spirit of prophecy seminar. But should be God first. Amen? Because the gift of prophecy is, is just God's communication to us. God first. Sometimes this is where we have some problems. You know? Um, it should be God first. We have, we have been discussing about uh, bra, uh, you know, while Waiting for the service, a brother came to me and said, so what's the difference somewhere? Maybe the difference, I said, there are people teaching, you know, give a prophecy, spirit of prophecy. And here, thou uh, dito, here in, in AUP, the gift of prophecy is not taught. Maybe they're wrong. Here, the word of God is taught. Maybe there, we teach here that the standard of faith and practice is the Bible. Maybe it could be somewhere that the standard of faith and practice is the spirit of prophecy. Which could be a wrong what, uh, priorities. Is it? Could be. You see? God first. God first. Um, many of you are young people here. So let me just talk to you. You will make a lot of decisions. I tell the pastors in Ayas under in my classes, I said, you have to take care of the young people. Amen? Uh, okay, so, because this is very crucial. They will make a lot of decisions. You will decide what course to take in college. Isn't it? You will decide who will be your wife. Yeah, there are a lot of decisions that you will make, you'll make at this stage. And so you need a lot of guidance. So what will you uh, uh, how will you decide what would be your procedure in a way in making decisions? I would suggest to you that maybe you'll ask three questions, very practical questions. May, you know, it, it did work for me a little bit, but I don't know with you. So if you have to make very crucial decisions, I, you have to make some questions, ask questions. First is, will it be profitable? That means... You know, uh, if you'll choose this career, will it be profitable? 
I don't, I am not suggesting that, that that should be the first consideration, okay? May, I've been to SAPAC one day, I met my classmate uh, in college and said, oh, so you're here. He's a pastor now and said, oh, I'm visiting my daughter here. And said, ah, your daughter is here. So she's, she's here? And he said, yes, taking nursing. Oh, okay. And she told, he told me that, you know, the daughter is complaining, uh, it's hard, study hard, you see, with anatomy book, it's very thick. And so when he calls his daughter, he said, hmm, pasensya na lang anak. Okay, I think we have foreigners here. Eh? He said, just be patient anak. Just consider that in every page there is a dollar there. <laughs> you know, the next page there's dollar there. So the thicker the book, the better. That should not. Because more dollars, the thicker the book, the uh, more dollars. Uh, you know, that should not be, but it should also be profitable. So first, second is, uh, will, it, will you enjoy it? Okay, will you be happy with, with that? Many now, this is graduation time, and many will be choosing a career. Some parents would like to force their children to take medicine, but will they be happy there? You know, you know. I know some will. Oh, I think I attended a graduation here the other uh, year. Uh, somebody gave us a speech, and then she said, "Now the curse is done. It's not the course; it's the curse. Now that I have finished nursing, I will now go to my first love, journalism." I have fulfilled the curse that was given by my father. <laughs> it's, uh, will you be happy there, you know, if you make decisions there? But above all else, this is the question that should you ask most is, will it glorify God? That means, you see, when we choose this girl, uh, Pwede mo bang madala yan sa uh, Divisoria? Okay, okay din yan. No? Ma madala mo ba yan sa Lunita? Uh, but above all else, will it glorify God? Okay, so God first. And that is uh, what happened to Jehoshaphat. It seems to me that this is very important. God first. He should have the priority. Okay? Let us look at uh, what Jehoshaphat did next. Then the people of Judah came together to seek the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Okay, so they were in Jerusalem, so people surrounding uh, towns came. Verse 5, Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard. Okay. So now, they were trying to solve their problem, they were trying to solve their crisis. Where did they try to solve their problem? Where? Where? Location seems to be very important here. Where? In the house of the Lord. Very strange. This man lives in the palace, isn't it? This man lives in the palace. The king lives in the palace. He doesn't live in the church. This is a political problem, by the way. It's a secular problem. And if you've been again to Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, there is what they call, the, you know, there's, there's the old city, the old, old city. They have, the, they have their <clears throat> somewhere about one and a half kilometer away is where the palace of, of, of David or the, king, the city of David they call. And, but that is about one and a half kilometer away from the temple. So this is a secular problem. He could have solved it in the palace. He could have called the generals and said, what shall we do? What would be the strategies that we will uh, take on this? But he tried to solve the problem where? In the house of the Lord. And when I'm, I was reading this, I said, this is a very good strategy, isn't it? Many a times, we try to solve our problems, our crisis, or even we use References for making decisions where? Outside. Outside of the church. 
we try sometimes we try to solve our problems in ABS CBN and the JMA, isn't it? Not in our system. Remember when I was a district pastor in Iligan, there were uh, brethren who, you know, they ha we had a little ghetto there near the sanitarium. Because the Adventist likes ghettos. You go to Pasai, for example, you have, uh, you have very, uh, you know, Liberisa, for example, that's an Adventist ghetto. Huh? You have so many Adventists there. But sometimes when we are near each other so much, maybe familiar, then uh, we get a little bit in trouble. So, nagkasuntukan itong dalawang uh, brethren. <clears throat> Yung isa, uh, he lost his teeth, and the other one had a black eye. And so they went to the uh, fiscal. And, but the fiscal said, okay, let us, let us try to reconcile you first before you bring this to the court. And so he said, what's your religion? I said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Fiscal, how about you? He said, oh, I'm also a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> and uh, since the sanitarium is quite well known in Iligan, he said, hmm, why did you come to me? You go to your pastor. You go to your pastor, and then you make things right, and then let your pastor give you a certificate that now you are reconciled, so that I will not, I'll not bring this uh, problem to the court. And so that is how I, you know, I knew the, about the problem. So he, they came and said, oh, we would like the, a certification from you, because now, you know, see, if we will be bringing ourselves to the, uh, to the court, we have to hire lawyers, and, on. and I said, Mas okay pa yung fiscal, alam niya kung saan kayo pupunta. Kayo hindi niyo alam. Yeah, it's better for the fiscal, uh, the, uh, the fiscal knew where uh, you should be going, not, uh, but you don't know where you will be going. And so we should, so we try to solve sometimes our crisis outside. Let us try to solve our crisis here. Let us in God's system, in His own way. And we have a lot of, we have biblical ways to, so, to solve some crises, isn't it? Conflict management, for example, Matthew chapter 18, huh? we call it a loving confrontation, you see? Amen? You know, in conflicts, there are two extreme, extreme reactions to a conflict. Only two. Fight or flight. Okay, the extreme form of fight is what? I will kill my opponent so that there will be no more problem. Of course, that is a big problem too, isn't it? That is the fight strategy. The flight strategy also, the most extreme is I will kill myself so that there will be no more problem. Uh, that is also bad, isn't it? That is why the Bible said, you meet at the middle. Huh? You, you talk and on. And this is what we should be doing. Uh, try to solve our problems in the system, in the church. Maybe we should be... Uh, I, I saw in our program that we should stop at about 9 o'clock, isn't it? So we still have a little time. Okay. Verse, so he stood in, up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not run away from our problems. You know, that is flight strategy. Many a times we run away. I was visiting a church member who had some problems in the church, and I said, Brother, we missed you in church. You are not coming to church anymore. I said, Oh, because we have a problem, Pastor. When we have problems, that is the time that we have to be in church, isn't it? Of course, sometimes if we, the problems are relational, you know, while we were, we were coming up here, I told a brother here, you know, most of the problems that we have, with some of our brethren who are, I will not call them offshoots. They are our cousins, you know, because they kept, they kept the Sabbath also. Most of their problems are not really theological. Most of the problems there are relational. It's not really theological. It's relational. And that is why sometimes most of our problems also inside the church. Relational problems. We have to solve it here. We have to solve it in the system. I remember though when I was a pastor, there was this uh, 
housewife, he, she borrowed money from another church member because her son was in the hospital. When Sabbath came, she wasn't able to return the money. So you see, sometimes it's not good to, to face the person who you owe some money. And so they were in the church, and she was sitting here, and the other one was sitting there. So while she was sitting there during the Sabbath school, she looked around and said, is that sister here, you know? And she saw the sister there, and the sister said, Actually, she was asking, you know, and because it, you know, they were still singing the Sabbath school, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the opening song. Said, and the sister was really asking, how's, how's your son? Is he okay now? Out of the hospital? But you know, we are guilty if we owe some money. Said, oh, this sister is very bad. She's collecting money from me already. You know, it's still Sabbath school time. And the next Sabbath, because she wasn't able to pay the money yet, so she said, I'll not go to church today. That's a flight strategy, isn't it? Solving our problem in the system, in the church. And this is what Jehoshaphat said. He did. I really was impressed with this. Okay, let us go to verse uh, 6. Okay, so he went to the temple and prayed. We cannot em uh, overemphasize prayer, isn't it? And this was... This was the prayer of Joshua. Very beautiful prayer. One of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. I remember the Dr. Iluma when he was still editor of the Philippine Publishing House. I think we had a we had a devotional book printed by the Philippine Publishing House. All the prayers in the Bible, isn't it? And this is one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. He said, "O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven?" You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it, have built in it the sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword or of judgment or plague of famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name. And we'll cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. It's a beautiful prayer. You know, he was talking to God. He said, you, you were the ones who brought us here. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came out of, from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the position you gave us as an inheritance. Verse 12, and I like this. Verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Amen? This is the prayer that conquers mountains. This is the prayer that can turn calamities into victories. We have no power. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. King, without power, Jehoshaphat had power. He had 1,160,000 soldiers. If you uh, go back to chapter 17, 18 of Second Chronicles. He was a very popular king. He had the support of his, of his countrymen. He was able to make reforms, judicial reforms, agricultural reforms, educational reforms. That means he was very popular. But he did not rely on his human power. He did not rely on his wisdom. But he said, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on thee. In other words, the strategy of Jehoshaphat for him to be able to succeed in this battle is surrender. The only way to succeed is to surrender. He surrendered to the Lord and said, Lord, we don't know what to do. Our eyes are on thee. So this is where we have some problems with our prayers sometimes, isn't it? Because when we come to the Lord, we have some problems. We come to the Lord, we bring proposals. I said, Lord, this is my problem, and this is my proposal. Kindly approve it, as if you are submitting it to a dissertation committee. Please, Lord, approve it. 
But you know, I would like to warn you, this kind of prayer is a very dangerous prayer. I don't know, Dr. Saban is here, you know, the, we had in MVC before, they said, itugyan na ba, itugyan. Oh, that was, yeah, you, you submit everything. You, you know, it's, it's very dangerous prayer because, say, for example, you, uh, you, uh, ladies, they said, Lord, uh, I'd like to get a sweetheart that, yung guapo, guapo po. Guapo hon. Uh, I don't know, many of you are Visayans here. Bisag dili kay guapo, basta kay guapo hon. Maybe uh, a little bit, you know, handsome. But if you will, if you will, if you will pray this kind of prayer and say, we don't know what to do, our eyes are on you, that means whatever you will say, Lord. And if the Lord will say, this one, he said, ayaw po na ginoo. Not that Lord, or you know, sometimes. So we have something already in our hearts. But this is the kind of prayer. This was a surrender. Uh, this was a prayer of surrender. And basically, it is what the Lord wants. Basically, He said, "Good." So this battle is not. So you have surrendered everything to me. And this is what the Lord said. Verse 13, all the men of Judah with their wives and children, little ones, stood there before the Lord. So everybody was praying. I like this. But here is, for me, the key to Jehoshaphat's success. All of this. You know, you know, he resolved to seek the Lord. He tried to solve his problem in the temple. He prayed and said, Lord, we don't know what to do. Our eyes are on thee. But then there was the turning point in this story. The epics, I will, I will say. Because then the gift of prophecy became active. Verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jezael, son of Zechariah, while they were praying. While they were saying, Lord, it's your will, not ours. While they were, he was saying, your will be done. You are the first consideration in whatever we will do. Then the Spirit of the Lord came. He said in verse 15, this is a very short message from the prophet at that time. In fact, Jehiel has never been mentioned again. But a prophet, a prophet means a spokesperson for the Lord, isn't it? A messenger. So this time it was Jehiel. Verse 15, he said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all of you who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Amen? How many of you here are theology students? If I will give you an exam, what would be the best title for the sermon? Okay, maybe if, if I am your teacher, I would accept a title which says, God fights battles for you. That could be a good theme, isn't it? My God will fight battles for me. That is why he is called the Lord of hosts. You see, the general, he fights battles for me. He said, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. It was because of that prayer. He said, Lord, we don't know what to do, our eyes are on thee. And God said, good, now I'll take over. Amen? This is the beauty when we give everything to the Lord. Because he has better plans. He said, my plans for you are what? what? To, trans to prosper. Sometimes we struggle so much. Okay? But I thought it's okay. Now the Lord said I'll do it. I thought that we will not do anything anymore if the Lord will do it for us. This is where the righteousness by works and faith comes in, isn't it? Because God still required Jehoshaphat to do something. Verse 16, tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of the seas and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. 
you will not have to fight this battle. But what will you do? Stand up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. End of the message. Now for me, this is the most critical part in the story. Because if I were Jehoshaphat, I would say, mm, what will we do with the spirit of prophecy? What will we do with the message? I can imagine the general said, Why, what, what is this? Why will you listen to this man? Maybe the neighbor said, he is also our neighbor, you know. You know? Uh, he also fights with his wife. Jezebel doesn't have a PhD from Ayas. He has not studied religion. Maybe he is not even rich, you see. Why should we? And the generals, if you really would like to listen to the generals, this is a bad, bad strategy. You see, why we should go out from Jerusalem? We should wait here because our city is walled. We have all our rations here. Our wives are here. We'll wait for them to attack. But this strategy of going out, and much more, going out, but then what will you do? Okay, you just stand there. Oh, yeah. Look at them. It is so illogical. It was irrational. And this is where we have the problems many times with the gift of prophecy, isn't it? Because the gift of prophecy tells us something that is against our reasons. Even against our own inclinations. And so what will we do? Because we don't like the message, what we do? We attack the messenger. That is what the lawyers will do in the court, isn't it? They have a witness, but they cannot, they cannot say something about what the witness is saying. So they attack the witness. And say, this is witness is not credible. So what he is saying is not also credible. And basically this is what we are doing with the gift of prophecy. You see, she was giving us a message and said, oh, she is not a good messenger. You know, she has some problem with, the, uh, you know, with her own mind and on. And for me, this is so much question. What shall, and Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat's success hinges on this. Whether he will listen to the voice of the prophet or not. And many a times, you see, we put reasons over our faith. Even here. Like to be reasonable. We seem to be relying more on reasons than on faith. If we, if we can prove it scientifically, then that's it. And we are happy, of course, now that uh, what Ellen White has been giving us has been proven scientifically, but it's a little bit late. The blue zones, for example, you know, blue zones, longevity. Have you heard about that? You know why uh, people, studies in National Geographic magazine, people were living longer. They, had, uh, they found three places in the world that, uh, uh, that people live longer. In Sardinia, in Loma Linda, and in Okinawa, Japan. And so they were, the world was amazed looking at this. And then, of course, now uh, we are at the lim limelight. But people will only believe if it is scientifically proven. But God, no, he doesn't. He said, just trust me. You know, maybe we can sing the song, God said it and I believe it and that's enough for me. Amen? Amen. God said it and I believe it and that's enough for me. And I would guess that this was the attitude of Jehoshaphat. God said it and I believe it. And that's enough for me. But I don't know why God operates this way. Why should he also give us something to do that should be reasonable? Why he does this? Because he wants us to believe. And when we believe, then it is a better motivation to do something. Uh, I, I remember, you know, maybe let us just uh, pick up some, uh, some examples. For example, when God has given Jericho to Joshua. 
what was the reasonable thing to do there? Of course, there's, there was nothing reasonable in, this is a walled city, and God said, okay, you want Jericho to, to be conquered? You just march around it. March. If I were Joshua, maybe I said, Lord, I don't think, uh, you know. What will these people inside this uh, city think about us? They will say, what happened to these Israelites? My Tupac? And then they were marching very silent. Because that was the instruction of the Lord. The seventh day, they marched. Uh, how many times? Seven times. At the end of the seventh march, ha! And Jericho fell down. Amen? Amen? Simple obedience, isn't it? Obedience without murmur, without complaints. God said it, and I believe it, and that's enough for me. Gideon. You know Gideon? Uh, who, who were the enemies of the Israel at that time? Midianites? Midianites. Gideon said, uh, the Midianites were as many as the sand, according to the Bible. As, huh? When my mother was telling me this story when I was a young boy, I really like it. I like uh, the picture that she used. She said, Murag bunhok kadaghan. The Visayans are, can understand that. Bunhok means hanip, you know? You know this? Yeah, the, the very small creatures there in the uh, nest of the chicken. So many. Against, against how many? Well, first, there were 32,000, of course. When Gideon said, okay, let's fight these Midianites. And 32,000 came. And well, they said, oh, the Lord said, too many Gideon. So you announced to them, those who have planted, you go home and, and on. So how many went at home? 22,000. So he had 10,000 left. said, oh, so many. You let them go through a stream. And now how many he had? He had only 300. And if I were Gideon, you see, simple calculation. So many, like the sand of the sea and the 300, it's really a no contest, isn't it? It's really a no contest. Maybe it could have been balanced if the Lord gave them AK-47, uh, M-16, <laughs> and uh, submachine guns against bow and arrows. But to add insult to injury, what the Lord asked them to bring? Trumpet, a torch, and a little jar. If I were Gideon, I said, Lord, binu ang niyo. You know, it's, it's really beyond logic, you see? Oh, you know, I, I like the Cebuana. Tinunto ni You know, what do you want us to do? You just want us to burn the noses of the Midianites so that they will run away? <laughs> but when Gideon obeyed the Lord without murmur and complaints, then they had victory. Amen? Amen. God said it, and I believe it, and that's enough for me. And I think this is why. Sometimes this is why the Lord wants us to go through a crisis, because He wants us to learn this. Trust. And here, the prophet said, okay, this is what you will do tomorrow. Go out. So, faith, you still have to do something, isn't it? Even if you believe, it's not just say, okay, God said it. God said it, and I believe it, and then that is what now, uh, uh, that will uh, motivate me to do something that the Lord wants me to do. So, Jehoshaphat, verse 18 bowed with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the Korahites and Korah, uh, 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 Korahites stood up and praised the Lord, the, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. And then we have our text. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they sat sit out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Parabang, like a, a basketball coach, he said, Listen to me, Judah and the people of Jerusalem. 
Have faith in the Lord your God and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets and you will be successful. For me, this was the key. That was the key. Because look at what had happened. It's really a nice ending story. And you know, faith sometimes is... I, when, I, when I read this account, I said, God has some, you know, humor here. Verse 21. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army. So now they were marching to meet the army. But who was at the head of the column? Choir. Have you seen an army facing a battle with a choir <laughs> at the forefront? The conventional warfare is that the, it's the tanks, you know, that, that tank, the shock troops. And then the infantrymen will be behind the tanks. So you've seen this in television. But this one now is the choir. They don't have even arms. They were just saying, give thanks for his love endures forever. But on second thought, I said, this is a wise strategy, actually. Because the Lord said, do not fight. You see, if, they, if he put at the head of the army the hot-headed uh, uh, soldiers, then they might fight. And so it was the, it was the, the choir. They were marching and said, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. But look at what had happened with the Lord. You know, when we obey, when we believe, what he will say, this is what happened. Verse 22. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon Amu, and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah. And they were defeated. The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men of, from, from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. God did it all for them. Amen? God said it. I will fight for you. And he did. And really what I like here is the result. Look at the result of faithfulness. Look at the result of listening to the voice of the Lord even if you don't understand. Verse 24. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. Amen. 100% victory. Not a single arrow flew from the camp of the Israelites. Not a single sword left the scabbard. Not a single drop of blood was shed. The Lord did it all for them because they believed. Because they obeyed without murmur, without complaints. 100% victory. That was result number one. Verse 25, so Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took them three days to collect it. Amen? So much money. You see? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of these things, including money will be added unto you. Amen? I will not promise you that if you'll read Great Controversy, you'll become a millionaire. <laughs> or the desire of ages. But at least you will not be poor. The result, second result was material blessings, basically. Let us look for other results. Verse 29. The fear of God came upon all the kingdoms of the countries when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. For me, this was the best evangelistic meeting, isn't it? Everybody knew who the God of Israel was. Because Je Jehoshaphat just... What else? Another result. Verse 30. And the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace. For his God has given him rest on every side. Peace, isn't it? So he had... Victory, 100%. The name of the Lord was glorified. He had peace. And even material blessings. There is still one more. I'd like to uh, bring your attention to verse 27. Now they have conquered. Three days of collecting silver, gold. 
and uh, clothing. Now they are ready to go back. Verse 27. Then led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned, what? Joyfully to Jerusalem. For the Lord has given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. Joy, isn't it? A direct result of obedience. A direct result of listening to the voice of God through the prophets. Joyfully. But there is still one secret of Jehoshaphat that I would like to share with you. So, how, how do we remember the secrets now? First, God first policy, isn't it? Second is, try to solve your crisis in the temple, inside the system. Third, pray, of course. You pray and say, Lord, we don't know what to do. Our eyes are on thee. And when the Lord gives you some guidance through the gift of prophecy or through whatever, the Bible, you know, through inspiration, obey without murmur, without complaints. And then, the result. Result, complete victory. He has turned crisis, or God turned crisis into opportunities. God turned calamities into victories. What else? Oh, he had material blessings. What else? He had peace, and the name of the Lord was glorified in his life, and he had joy. But there is still one more secret of Jehoshaphat that I would like to share with you, because many a times... Our success is only one time. It's not, it's not consistent. Why was it? We saw people, ah, oh, so successful. And then later on, they're not there anymore. Maybe because they have not followed. One more secret for Jehoshaphat. Because let us look at verse 28. They entered Jerusalem. You know, they were marching from victory now. Going back to Jerusalem, of course, now the... The head of the army is Jehoshaphat. Let us uh, read verse 27 again. Then led by Jehoshaphat, all, and men, all, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem. For the Lord has given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to where? They went to the house of the Lord. This is really significant because many a times when we have victories, where will we celebrate? Uh, it should have been the most logical place for Jehoshaphat to celebrate is in the palace. To have a party. Yeah, victory. He said, oh, it was me. Yeah, when the Lord has given us victories, you see, our first salary... Where did we, you know, for those of you who will be graduating, where will you place them? We have our bonus in Dece the, during December. You give them to Mr. C, you know, SM. And maybe you give it to, uh, that is, uh, Robinsons. And then you give to the Lord, uh, yung natitira lang. Okay. So we don't give back to the Lord the honor and glory. And that is why the Lord cannot continue the blessings and the success. When we were district pastors, you know, some of the brethren will come to us and say, Pastor, can we borrow some money because of this and this? And sometimes they said, okay, tomorrow we'll return the money, but money will not re be returned. So we set up a, some kind of you know, a policy with my wife and said, if brethren will come, we will not have money anyway, but we'll give them a little, like 100 pesos, 200 pesos, so that they can use this to go to other places and borrow from some. But there are people who can, <laughs> yes, at least they will not, you know, I said, please, you know, I have, we have 200, and you can, you can use this to go to other places. But there are people who really are good. They will borrow ma money, 1,000 pesos, and said, Tomorrow, Pastor, 1,000 is here. And they are really faithful. The next, I said, maybe uh, 2,000, Pastor, and then the 2,000 will be back at the exact time. 5,000, 10,000, it will happen. Then later on, they will not borrow anymore. So he said, why don't you borrow 20,000? <laughs> we are the one offering because it will always return. I thought if the Lord maybe is like this, yeah? He will give us a little blessing and said, we'll see. Try me, try me. Or I will try you. Okay. If it will return, he said, I, I'll add more. 
And then I will add more. I will add more. But sometimes, 20,000 pa lang nga, eh, wala na. We are not returning to the Lord. So, so the Lord will not continue the blessings that the Lord has given to us or the successes. But Jehoshaphat, he went back where? He went back to the temple. Everything was returned to the Lord. I, you know, if you have successes like Bill Gates, for example, or what, 90% belongs to the Lord, only 10%. Have you read the book, uh, the books of Bo Sanchez? Bo Sanchez. Bo Sanchez. You know, I, I, I was attracted to one of his books, uh, How to Be Truly Rich. I like that. And I think the goal of Bo Sanchez is that he will return 60% of his income to the Lord and only 40%, uh, he will live on the 40%. I know of somebody who came to Mountain View College before who donated these uh, Ten Commandments, you know, here in the campuses uh, of Adventist colleges. You go to any Adventist college in the Philippines, you'll always have the Ten Commandments there. This was the one, uh, Mr. Elliot, I, I, if I remembered, with, Dr., uh, with Elder West. Mr. Elliot, he was an old man then, but he said, I have given back to the Lord 90% of my income. I just live on the 10% that I have. That, you know, for myself. And it's, it's good, you know. But the idea is to return to the Lord. The blessings, the successes. And then it can continue. It will continue. I think you have read in our devotional what happened to Vanderbilt and Rockefeller. The Rockefeller Foundation and that Vanderbilt. The two big uh, businessmen or uh, known wealthy people in the United States. And where are, the, where are these now? The Rockefeller is still there, but the Vanderbilt is no longer there because they are not returning back what the Lord has given to them. And so my brothers and sisters, how to turn calamities into victories, catastrophes into opportunities. Seek God first. Put him the priority. So you can try to solve our crisis in, inside God's system, in the temple. Third, we pray, said, Lord, we don't know what to do. Our eyes are on thee. And then when the Lord impresses us, or gives us a message through the Bible, through the gift of prophecy, obey without murmur, without complaints. And then return back the glory and honor to him and you will be successful so i will end this message with a theme i suppose for this conference today at uh, this weekend second chronicles chapter 20 verse 20 listen to me judah and the people of jerusalem have faith in the lord your god and you will be upheld have faith in his prophets and you will be successful